Happy day after St. Patrick's Day, and thank you for starting off a new week with CNN 10. I'm Carl Azus at the CNN Center. Investigators in the South Pacific Island nation of New Zealand say they're working to find out if an Australian citizen who occasionally lived in New Zealand was there to carry out a terrorist attack. On Friday, the suspect sent an 87-page email to the Prime Minister's office and dozens of other addresses minutes before the attack began, too soon for police to respond, according to the Prime Minister. Afterward, police say the suspect carried out shootings at two mosques in the city of Christchurch, leaving 50 people dead and 50 others wounded. The attacks were made as Muslims were gathered for Friday prayers. Investigators have not discussed what the alleged shooter's motives were, but his email spoke out against Muslims and described immigrants as invaders. Though police initially arrested several people afterward, only one suspect was charged in connection with the shootings. Police reportedly captured him by ramming the car he was driving 36 minutes after the attacks began. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says there were more firearms in his car and that he would have continued the attack if he hadn't been caught. Police said after the arrest that their focus would shift toward helping the families and the victims of the shootings, making sure those affected would get the support and help they need. As makeshift memorials appeared around the mosques, promises of support, prayers and donations were being made by leaders, citizens and religious organizations from all over the world. From the South Pacific, we're taking you to South America. Last week, we reported on a rare widespread blackout in Venezuela that added to the country's economic and political problems. Electricity went out in 19 of Venezuela's 23 states. And while the government's information minister says the outage has been completely restored, CNN teams on the ground there say this is true for a lot of the capital, Caracas, but the lights aren't on everywhere. Another issue all this created was a water shortage. 70% of Caracas now has drinking water and 80% of the rest of the country, again, according to its information minister. But while the Venezuelan government accuses the United States and Venezuela's opposition leader for trying to bring down the electrical grid, the priority for many residents is getting their taps to run clean. At its worst, the blackout triggered a water crisis so severe there was a degrading scramble for water, any water, even dirty water, whatever the drainage pipes in the stream could offer up. The water shortage has eased up a bit, but not the indignity of finding water wherever and however you can, even coming from inside a highway tunnel and an open pipe. I mean, look at this water. It is not clean. There is debris in the water. There is garbage. There are insects. And yet people are very desperate and they're happy to have this water right now telling me that they are using it for bathing and for anything else that they need to be doing. They know they can't drink it, but right now, this is all they have. It's tough. It's very tough, he tells me. We need water for everything. If we don't have water, we can't do anything. Black goop instead of water ran through these faucets when the power did come back on. Residents posted on social media of a water system rarely maintained or repaired. Ana Ramirez says she's afraid that now the water system will never recover. She's done without in her tiny apartment in the barrio of Petare since the blackout started last week. And Venezuela is still running out of water. Unthinkable in a country once blessed with vast water resources, years of neglect and now drought have left many struggling and scavenging to get water, as it too has now become a luxury. Paul Newton, CNN. Caracas. The governor of the U.S. state of Nebraska says nearly every region of his state is dealing with historic flooding. This is all part of the bombogenesis, or bomb cyclone, that blew east off the Colorado Rockies last week. It blasted that state's capital and many other parts of the central U.S. with blizzard conditions and nearly hurricane force winds. Heavy rains and flooding were all part of it, and that continues to be a problem in Nebraska as piles and drifts of snow melt swell rivers and flood communities. Nebraska's emergency management agency says records have been broken in at least 17 locations and that more of that's expected. The water has never been measured this high along the Missouri, Platte, and Elkhorn rivers. 53 counties, 54 cities, and two Native American tribes have declared emergencies. Most of the areas affected by the bomb cyclone are expected to have calmer weather this week, but as the snow continues to melt and the rainwater runs down hills into creeks and rivers, the flooding threat isn't over. Bridges destroyed. 
highways washed out, cars and cattle stranded. This is the aftermath of a bomb cyclone. The powerful weather system slammed the Midwest with hurricane-like winds and blizzard conditions last week, leaving drowning rains and flooding in its wake. And after heavy snowfall this winter, natural snowmelt is making bad conditions worse. In Wisconsin, Darlington officials say the city hasn't seen this much flooding in more than 25 years. Fremont, Nebraska, home to more than 26,000 people, became an island when roadways in and out of town flooded Friday. Nebraska's governor touring the damage in his state. This has probably been the, you know, the, the most severe widespread flooding we've had most, you know, as far as the, the, part of the parts of the state's been impacted, we've had in the last half century. Nebraska rescue teams have been pulling trapped residents out of flood water since Thursday. And forecasters caution, more snow melt is on the way. So the worst flooding may be yet to come. Kaylee Hartung, CNN. 10 second trivia. Miss Cheesiest, Halal Guys, and Salt and Straw are all restaurants that started as what? Shark Tank investments, chain restaurant spinoffs, food trucks or carts, or hot dog stands. All of these restaurants were once run out of a cart or a truck, a food truck. Whether you're an aspiring or already successful chef, there are a number of challenges associated with opening a food truck. Ingredient costs, kitchen costs, permit costs, not to mention the cost of losing customers when the weather doesn't cooperate, it's all part of it. But CNN recently caught up with the Taco Beast, a snowbound snowcat that serves food. Its chefs don't mind if it's snowing outside, though we're not sure what they do in the summer. When I fire up the beast, I kind of feel like I'm piloting a spaceship. You know, it's still dark outside, you press one button and you light up the sky. I have the best office view in the world. We look at the flat tops every morning, it's not a bad day. As much as I'd love to be on my snowboard at that point in time, I still enjoy driving this the beast. We meet at the bottom of the gondola and head up on the first one in the morning at 6.30. We head here to our docking station with the Taco Beast. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, man, what's going on? Oh, it is epic champagne powder all around. I've been Steamboat for 30 years. I've opened up about half the restaurants in town. I've been working outside for the mountain for like three. I'm only in the kitchen for a couple hours a day for what I do mostly out there. Oh, some funny questions like, oh, do you leave the kitchen here and you drive the snowcat away? Nope, nope. We... pop-up camper? Yeah. <laughs> we're selling out all the time, so people are definitely liking what we're throwing down, for sure. saying bat in the belfry usually applies to someone who's said to be a little crazy. What about having a bat in the newsroom? Is it going to drive reporters batty? It did for a while at WCBI's newsroom in Columbus, Mississippi, when a flying mammal somehow found its way inside. A couple of fearless employees eventually trapped the animal in a conference room, and they didn't need to hold a conference to decide the bat was better off outside. The staff of WCBI then waved WC bye bye, not batting an eye when Batman flitted back out into the dark night. Letting him hang out inside would have been a chiropt terrible idea. Even if you gotta wing it sometimes in news, some of the most battle tested reporters would wanna fly to a different echo location. I'm Carla Zeus, batting a thousand for CNN 10. <laughs>